willing to make. I'm honored today to present our speaker, Brian Crawford. Brian is a <clears throat> retired computer programmer, programmer living in Marin County with his wife, Linda, and son, Nathan. He has written many fiction and historical books, including Shipwrecks of Marin and The Bellinas Fairfax Road, a history of one of Marin's most scenic routes. <clears throat> Born in Ohio in 1947, Brian attended Ohio State and Antioch College, but dropped out and went to the Haight-Ashbury for the Summer of Love. Many adventures around the world followed. He returned to the U.S. in 1974, married Linda, and had their son, Nathan, in 1988. <clears throat> Retired in 2014, Brian pursued many outdoor activities and participated with numerous civic groups. He also volunteers as a researcher and archivist in the map annex of the California Marin County Free Library. He's done research and written articles for the Marin History Museum, the California Room, and the San Anselmo Historical Society. So please welcome Brian Crawford. Hi, thank you. Um, welcome everyone. Um, good morning. Um, I appreciate you um, logging in to check this out. I hope everybody is uh, can hear and see adequately. Um, if you have questions, as I said, you can uh, move your cursor to the bottom of the screen and open a chat and you can talk to Joe and um, hopefully uh, resolve any issues. Um, so let me begin. Um, how did I become uh, the self-appointed expert on shipwrecks in Marin? Well, I'm one of those um, peculiar people who love to read old newspapers. And um, the University of California, Riverside has this wonderful website called California Digital Newspaper Collection, where they publish um, many, many newspapers. Uh, six million pages of newspapers are posted there online for everyone's access. So you can browse around and search for things. So I do a lot of my research there. And um, in doing that, I stumbled upon uh, the wreck of the steamship Pacific. This was, um, it, it went down in a collision off Cape Flattery, Washington um, in 1875. And it was just um, a terrible wreck. Um, it, it, no one knows how many people died because there was a crowd that went aboard just at the last minute and they bought their tickets on board. A lot of gold miners um, coming down from British Columbia. Uh, crowded aboard and they were all carrying lots of gold in their pockets, which was not a good thing when they struck the ship, uh, the clipper Orpheus, and uh, went down so fast that uh, people said it couldn't have sunk faster if it had been made of glass. So um, I ended up writing a book about this called this um, Steamship Pacific. And um, in doing the research for it, I was scanning the newspapers for any mention of the word wreck and founder and sinking and things like that. And I just kept coming on so many hits that were not related to the Steamship Pacific, but were other wrecks. And I realized how many of them were on the coast of Marin County. Um, and that just kind of got me curious, you know, how many were there? Um, and so I started uh, doing a little um, work on it and found that there were many hundreds of wrecks. Uh, these are all pictures of wrecks. Um, on the Marin County coast. This is a tiny sample. Um, there are several lists of wrecks that have been compiled by the Park Service, by the Maritime Museum, um, by various authors. And um, I went through all those lists and, and uh, uh, brought them together into a list and, and eliminated duplicates and came up with um, over 250 wrecks. But as I went through the newspapers, I found many wrecks that weren't on anybody's list. Um, and so I just started collecting them and ended up um, deciding to write a book about the shipwrecks of Marin that would be the definitive text on every known shipwreck that has occurred in Marin County. Um, and so it seemed that uh, there was a wreck nearly every week, it, it seemed. And um, I was wondering why, you know, why is it so terrible? And the reason is, of course, our geography. It's not a forgiving coastline. Any ship that comes on this coast and doesn't go into one of the um, rather obscure and hard to see entrances into the, into the bays 
um, runs into a very rocky coastline. And of course, also it's foggy. Um, so the very first European ship to lay eyes on Marin, Francis Drake, he commented on the fog in 1579. Hence come those thick mists and most stinking foggers wherein a blind pilot is as good as the best director of a course. So in the 442 years since he was here, hundreds of captains have strained their eyes into the murk and muttered very similar sentiments. This is just a, a small portion. This is just Point Reyes and uh, some of the known shipwrecks along that part of the coast. Um, Marin is often considered a graveyard of ships. There are 84 known wrecks on Point Reyes alone and 50 more on Duxbury Reef at Belenas. I was struck by the number and frequency of the wrecks and I started a, a systematic search of the, of the newspapers. Um, many were filled with uh, real drama, people fighting for their lives in the icy waters, uh, tragic losses, heroic lifesavers risking their lives to save others and experienced captains making fatal mistakes. I determined to write a definitive collection of every known shipwreck in Marin. This of course required defining the scope of the work. Just what is a ship, what is a wreck, and what is Marin? Um, I, I arbitrarily decided that a ship was anything larger than a skiff or a rowboat. Stories of duck hunters shooting the bottom out of their own skiff didn't make the list. Similarly, a wreck meant actually sinking or going aground. They're not necessarily lost. Many of these ships were uh, pulled off and saved. Um, then the other issue was what to include geographically. So um, I de defined the geographic limits of Marin County as the way the government does, three miles off the Pacific coast, uh, then following the county line around the south and the Bay Coast. Uh, this includes much of San Pablo Bay and all but tiny slivers of Red Rock and Angel Island, um, but almost none of the Golden Gate except the actual southern shore of the headlands. Uh, there is a number of wrecks that hit either Angel Island or Red Rock, and I had to carefully research which side of the islands they hit to determine if they were in Marin or not. Um, with so many wrecks documented, I can only touch on a handful of the um, more important and dramatic ones today. In my researches, I came up with 307. Um, that's what I put in my book. I'm now working on a second edition and I've identified 23 more. So I'm up to 330 and still going. Uh, the first wreck here, and uh, one of the most famous, is the wreck of the San Augustine in 1595. This is the first recorded shipwreck in California. Uh, it occurred more than 400 years ago in November of 1595. After Magellan discovered the Philippines in 1521, the Spanish encountered Chinese traders who made regular trips to Manila with their priceless silks, spices, and porcelain. New Spain produced vast amounts of silver from the Inca mines of Peru, and the Chinese would take all they could get. The westward passage from Acapulco to Manila was relatively straightforward as they could just ride the prevailing trade winds all the way. The return trip was the problem because the winds between the two ports always blew from east to west. In 1565, Friar Andres de Urdaneta sailed north to the 38th parallel off the coast of Japan before turning east. He found steady westerlies that carried him across the Pacific to the coast near Mendocino, then followed it south to Acapulco. A feasible trade route had finally been discovered. From that time on, one or two ships packed with silver, known as the Acapulco Galleons, would sail from Acapulco each January, taking about three months to reach Manila around April. After loading with the richest Chinese goods, the ships, now called the Manila Galleons, would sail in July, reaching Mexico about four months later in November. This annual voyage continued for exactly 250 years, and made Spain the richest and most powerful nation in the world. In 1579, only 14 years after the establishment of the trade route, English privateer, not pirate, Francis Drake sailed around the Horn into the Pacific and took the treasure ship Cacafuego, capturing so much treasure it financed the British treasury for decades. 
allowing them to build enough warships to fight off the Spanish Armada nine years later, possibly saving English civilization. After the capture, Drake headed up to California to try to intercept the Manila Galleon. He failed to find it and put into a sheltered bay for repairs, becoming the first European to land in Northern California. Most experts agree that he landed at Drake's Bay in Marin County. He moved his cargo and cannon ashore, careened his ship to clean her bottom, then reloaded to start for home. Since he was going by way of China, he didn't need a large quantity of Chinese porcelain that he had captured from the Spanish. So he left it on the beach, along with up to 30 of his crew, including his mulatto girlfriend, to find his own way home. Drake's attack shocked the Spanish. Captains of the galleons wanted protected harbors on the American coast where they could find shelter and repair and provision their ships while protected from the English. Since the coast of California was almost completely unknown, King Philip sent out an exploring expedition to chart the coast and look for suitable harbors. The man he chose for the job was Sebastian Cermeno, a 35-year-old Portuguese navigator of great abilities and experience. Cermeno leased a galleon, the San Augustine, of about 80 feet and 200 tons. He hired a crew of 80 of the best seamen he could find in Manila. They loaded 150 tons of cargo, mostly porcelain, gold, and silk. They also, earned, they also carried a st sturdy launch, disassembled for stowage, to assist in the survey of the American coast. Riding low in the water with her heavy cargo, the San Augustine left Manila on July 5th, 1595. After a hard voyage, they finally spotted land near Point Trinidad in Humboldt County. Sermenio's crew were exhausted and unhealthy, and everyone was concerned about the soundness of the ship. They started cruising slowly down the coast, looking for a protected harbor where they could refit and do some hunting for the fresh food they craved. Finally, they spotted a long high ridge jutting out from the coast. Exploring cautiously around it, they found a sheltered bay in its lee. Sermenio ordered the anchor dropped in seven fathoms of water where a stream ran down to the sea. It was November 7th, 1595, four months and two days out of Manila. The crew set to work on repairs. Friendly trading was established and Sermenio noted that the coast Miwok seemed surprisingly unsurprised by the wonders of the European ship. Though he did not know it, this was probably because they were the same people who had met his enemy Drake 16 years earlier. For three weeks, they repaired and resupplied the ship. They assembled the launch, essentially a very large dugout canoe built by the Filipino natives. Then in late November, a heavy gale struck, this time from the Southwest. No, no longer protected by the high walls of Point Reyes, the San Augustine swung stern on to the beach and tugged viciously at her anchor. Sermenio and most of his men were ashore at the time and could only watch helplessly as the anchor pulled free and the galleon drove up onto the beach with massive seas washing over her decks. The few men remaining aboard fought for their lives, but several were drowned. Some accounts say some say four, others seven or twelve. As the survivors looked on in horror, the ship was smashed to pieces and the precious cargo lost in the surf. When the storm finally passed, Sermenio gathered his men. Their only chance of reaching home, he told them, was for all 76 survivors to cram into the tiny launch and try to sail more than 2,500 miles to Acapulco. They had saved a few bales of silk and some crates of porcelain. Sermeno had these buried on the beach to be picked up later. They loaded the few provisions and supplies they had salvaged into the launch and set off to the south, very low on food and very likely hope. They stopped occasionally to gather acorns and other native foods but continued pressing on every day. Six weeks later, they arrived in Acapulco. Sermeno had managed this tremendous open boat journey without losing a single man. Sermeno never returned to salvage the treasure or reclaim the cargo he had hidden. Both are still under the sand in Drake's Bay in spite of several attempts to locate the wreck. It's strange to think that of the 40,000 miles of the Pacific coastline of North America, the first two vessels to Northern California, completely unknown to each other, both left Chinese porcelain within a few hundred yards of each other on the same stretch of Marin County Beach. 
Eight years after Semeno left, another Spanish explorer, Sebastian Vescaino, sailed by the area and named it Punta de los Reyes. No one else visited the coast for more than two centuries. The next account we have of a shipwreck in Marin was 246 years later. This was a small French schooner, Ayacucho, in October of 1841. Her owner and supercargo was a 29-year-old Breton named Joseph Yves Limentour. He had come to Veracruz in 1831 and by 1836 had established a trading business based in Mexico City. He purchased the Ayacucho and began trading between Valparaiso and California. The Mexican colonies in California were forbidden to trade with foreigners, so they were eager for manufactured goods. In October 1841, Limentour was bringing a load of valuable luxury goods from Mexico to San Francisco. Like many after him, in the fog, he mistook the looming bulk of Point Reyes for the Moran headlands and turned east into what he thought was the Golden Gate. Instead, the ship drove onto the sands on the eastern shore of Drake's Bay, not far from where the San Augustine had gone aground. The schooner was not badly damaged and the crew managed to get ashore safely. Lehman Tour set off on foot to San Rafael and acquired transport to San Francisco, still called Yorba Buena then. He arranged for his cargo to be brought to the town where the local elite snapped up his exotic goods. The Ayacucho was written off as a total loss and eventually broke up in the surf. Limentour returned to Mexico City, a wealthy man. Limentour came back to San Francisco 12 years later in 1853. By this time, California was an American state and the gold rush had turned the village of Yerba Buena into the city of San Francisco with a quarter of a million people. Limentour had with him a number of Mexican land grants signed by the governor of California in 1841, Manuel Mezotorena, granting several large tracts of land to Jose Limentour. The lands claimed were enormous, over 300 square miles, including Cape Mendocino, Tiburon, Alcatraz, the Farallones, much of Monterey, Tulare, and Lake counties, and all of the city of San Francisco, south of California Street. As you might imagine, uh, Limentour's claims were taken to court. Some experts initially judged that the grants and signatures were authentic, but after four years of legal battles, the federal court ruled that the grants were forgeries. Limentour was arrested for fraud, but ever resourceful, he posted bail and skipped to Mexico City, where he died in 1885. All that remains of Limentour's supposed empire in California is the lovely beach that bears his name. The next wreck I wanted to talk about also left its name in Marin. This is the Duxbury, though it barely qualifies as a shipwreck. She was built in Boston in 1833 and was only 109 feet long, though a full rigged three masted ship. She worked the Atlantic coast for the first 15 years, but then came the news of the gold strike in California and hundreds of thousands of men suddenly wanted to get to California as quickly as possible. A group of 25 Harvard students and alumni decided to give up their careers and join the rush. They formed themselves into the Old Harvard Company. They raised the funds and bought the Little Duxbury. They hired an experienced captain, 36-year-old William Cheever Norina. They published this poster to attract paying passengers, especially ladies, you'll note down here, um, though none took them up on the offer. The fare of $125 is equivalent to about $4,000 today. So it was a significant uh, outlay. In the middle of a New England winter, they set out into the Atlantic on February 9th, 1849. They knew they had many months of travel before them. The fastest ships took well over 100 days to reach California and the Duxbury was anything but fast. But the boys were young and enthusiastic and fun loving and they threw themselves into the work of driving the ship south. They made up games and sports and played practical jokes on each other. One wag started a ship's newspaper called The Petrel, full of jokes and anecdotes at the expense of one boy or another. On August 21st, as they were approaching their destination, they encountered thick fog near the coast. Captain Verena thought that they were entering the Golden Gate, but then there was a jolting halt. The Duxbury was too far north and had struck the reef at the mouth of Bolinas Bay that now bears her name. 
Duxbury Reef, uh, as you can see, it, it nearly blocks the entrance to the to Bolinas Bay, um, and um, at, at low tide, as in this picture, it, it runs out for miles. At high tide, that whole end of that isn't visible, and it uh, has presented a serious hazard to navigation for uh, a century. Uh, fortunately, the damage was slight, and the passengers and crew pulled the ship off the reef with their own boats and back into open water. The next day, they arrived in San Francisco, sold the ship, and headed out for the gold fields. Of course, uh, like most gold miners, not many of them got rich, but a few did. One of the members of the company was a dentist named Dr. Galen Burdell, who later founded the town of Point Reyes Station and who owned Rancho Alumpali. Mount Burdell in Nevada was named for him. Another ship that left its name is the steamship Tennessee. The Tennessee was a fine first class vessel built in New York in 1848 and intended for the run between New York and Savannah. She was a 211 foot wooden side wheel steamer of 1200 tons. But the news of the discovery of gold in California abruptly changed her career as it did those of so many ships and people around the world. She was purchased by the Pacific Mail Steamship Company and refit to carry an additional 350 passengers in steerage. In 1849, she steamed through the Straits of Magellan and up to Panama, arriving in March 1850. The Tennessee was the first, car, the first large ship to arrive there after the news of the gold strike swept around the world. 3,000 would-be passengers met her at the dock and clamored for passage to San Francisco, offering any fare. She took on as many as could be crammed aboard and sailed to San Francisco, where the eager prospectors soon fanned out for the diggings. Assigned to Captain Edward Mellis, she was put on the regular run between San Francisco and Panama, bringing more miners to San Francisco on every trip. On Saturday, March 5, 1853, Captain Mellis obtained a sighting that indicated they were about 100 miles from the Golden Gate. Around dusk, she entered a thick bank of fog and he reduced his speed and stationed lookouts forward to give warning of land. At 1 a.m. on Sunday, March 6th, a lookout shouted that he saw a high rock ahead to starboard. Captain Mellis guessed that it was Mile Rock on the southern side of the Golden Gate and steered accordingly. Soon afterwards, land was seen close on the starboard side, which was taken to be Point Lobos. More assured now, Mellis increased his steam, but suddenly a sandy beach appeared directly ahead. Captain Mellis reversed the engines, but at the same time, a ledge of rock was seen immediately astern of the ship. Unable to go either forward or back, he tried to turn her in her own length by repeatedly reversing. But without any momentum, the seas began to take control of her. The stern struck the sand with an impact that threw the dishes from the tables. The confusion and excitement when she first struck was great, but order was promptly restored. The sea then swung her around and she went broadside onto the beach. As soon as she went on the ground, Mr. Dowling, the chief mate, jumped overboard and swam to shore with a line by which to haul a hawser ashore. Although exhausted, he immediately climbed back on the line and returned to the ship to resume his duties. It was 9.30 Sunday morning. It was soon discovered that she lay in Potato Cove, since renamed Tennessee Cove, four miles north of her intended destination. In a way, she was lucky. They had struck the only sandy beach in miles. Also, the sea was quite calm and the ship rested fairly comfortably on a level bed of sand. A quick inspection showed that she was still perfectly tight. The passengers, mail, baggage, and provisions were all safely landed from the ship within four hours, and there was every expectation of getting her off with little damage. The crew brought the sails ashore and erected makeshift tents for the passengers, complete with beds and bedding. Some of the officers led a party of 100 passengers, including four ladies, overland to Sausalito to get help. They straggled into town late in the afternoon. Wires were sent to the ship's agents in San Francisco, and the steamer Confidence was dispatched to Sausalito to pick up the hikers. The steam tug Goliath, Captain Totten, was hired to go to the site of the wreck. When she arrived, they found the seas had turned the big ship's head to the shore, embedded two feet deep in the sand. The Goliath anchored close by to, for the night. 
during Monday night, the rollers came in heavily on the beach, lifting the ship up from four to five feet and thumping her heavily down on the sand as they ran back. By Tuesday morning, she was clearly stuck and she was a wreck. The Tennessee gradually broke up and the pieces drifted away over the following months. The engines and machinery remained visible for many years. Today, they lie beneath the sands of Tennessee Beach, but every few years, a winter storm will strip away the sand and children climb on the rusted iron of her mighty engines. By the way, I just noticed a, a thing in uh, Facebook this week that someone had seen a piece of the engine there on the beach. It's down at the uh, far south end of the beach, uh, down in here. I, I saw it once myself. The next wreck I'm going to talk about is a little known. It didn't leave its name here, uh, but it is one of the more tragic uh, wrecks in Marin. This was the Bark Haddingtonshire in 1888. The, uh, the Bark Haddingtonshire was a British iron bark, 215 feet long. She was under the command of Captain John Fraser of Inverness, Scotland. It was his very first command. The crew consisted of 21 hand-picked uh, young men and boys from Glasgow. Her maiden voyage was to the Columbia River in Oregon. There they loaded more than 17,000 cases of canned salmon and 12,000 barrels of flour worth over $100,000. On the 4th of July, 1885, she left Astoria bound for home. Captain Fraser wished to impress his owners with a quick trip, so he carried as much sail as possible. As they approached the equator on the 25th of July, they were struck by a sudden severe cyclone that knocked the bark flat with her mast in the water. After two terrifying hours, she slowly righted, water pouring off her decks. When they called the roll of the crew, they found four men missing. One lifeboat was gone, the rigging was wrecked, and the chronometer and both sextants had been smashed. Unable to navigate, the captain turned back to San Francisco for repairs. They began beating back north by dead reckoning alone, making repairs as they could and pumping day and night. It took them six long weeks, but finally they figured they were approaching the Golden Gate on Wednesday, August 19th. As was the captain's wont, she had all sails set. Courses, let's see, the courses are these sails down here, lower topsails, upper topsails, and the royals all set. That's uh, pretty much putting the pedal to the metal. The weather was clear and there was a bright moon, but near midnight a thick fog set in. One of the men, a Norwegian named Hans Merkison, on coming off lookout at midnight, reported that he had noticed a change in the color of the water and believed they must be close to shore. The captain paid no attention to Murkison's fears, but he ordered the foghorn to be sounded every minute. The wind was rising, threatening a storm. The captain ordered the royal sent down, but left all the other sails set. He then retired to his cabin, leaving the bark in the hands of his first mate, Mr. Cunningham. At 2 a.m. Thursday morning, one of the apprentices, 16-year-old Willie Murray, was heaving the log to gauge their speed. He reported to the mate that they were making eight knots. At that moment, the lookout on the forecastle cried out, land ahead. Mr. Cunningham peered forward and thought he saw a light flash out briefly from somewhere high above. He shouted for the captain and called all hands to reduce sail, but the Haddington shirt drove onto a sandy beach at nearly full speed. The bark heeled steeply to starboard and began pounding violently on the sand. Big waves swept completely across the deck. Captain Fraser rushed out of his cabin, took one look at the half-submerged ship, and ordered all hands into the one remaining lifeboat to abandon the ship. But as it was being lowered, a huge wave smashed it against the side of the ship, shattering it into splinters. With no means of escape and the seas continuing to sweep across the deck, Captain Fraser ordered the men to climb into the rigging to get above the waves. Murray and 12 other men and boys scrambled up into the main rigging, Murkison and the steward and the, into the mizzen rigging. The captain and the first mate went below to fetch signal rockets and flares called blue lights. Coming up the companionway into the ma maelstrom on deck, the captain was knocked down by a wave and the rockets were swept from his hands. He managed to light one of the flares, then he and the mate climbed up into the mizzen rigging. They had to climb up into the topmost rigging as the waves were now reaching the lower tops that is uh, about this high on the ship. So that's how deep the water was when the waves were coming over. 
They clung there until about 3.30 when the violent motion and the waves started to carry away parts of the rigging. Seeing that the mast could not stand much longer, the captain ordered the men back to the deck. Hans Merkison tried to climb down the rigging, but the steward was beneath him and seemed frozen in fear. The Norwegian grabbed a backstay and slid down to the deck. Just as he did so, the main mast collapsed over the side, pulling the mizzen down with it. Everyone was thrown into the water. Merkison was washed into the sea with the captain and steward. He was the strongest swimmer and tried to lead the other men toward the shore. The waves were tossing around crates of salmon and the three men became separated. Merkison was caught by a huge breaker and thrown up onto the beach. He was slammed down onto the sand so hard that he lost consciousness. After the mast came down, Willie Murray found himself on deck, tangled in the broken rigging. He crawled up out of the wreckage, but an instant later, a wave swept him overboard into the icy sea. He could hear men screaming and crying for help, but it was so dark he could see nothing. All the events of his life passed before his eyes, and especially the faces of his family and images of his home in Scotland. Terrified and exhausted, he gave up hope and resolved to breathe in water and drown to end his misery. He sank and the water closed over his head, but almost immediately his toes touched sand. Regaining hope, he pushed off the bottom and resumed his struggle, though the surf dragged him back out again and again. He was slammed down hard on the sand and twisted his ankle painfully. He leaped up and hobbled up the beach out of reach of the waves, then collapsed in a faint. When he awoke, he guessed that several hours had passed. He sat up and looked around. He had no idea where he was. It was still very foggy, but there was the faintest hint of dawn in the sky. He was soaked and shivering in the icy wind. He couldn't see the ship or any of the crew, just a long straight beach running off into the darkness in both directions. He called, but received no answer. His ankle was very swollen and painful. He struggled up the beach to a line of scrubby sand dunes, then made his way along them until at last he came upon a path. He followed it inland until he caught the familiar sound of cows mooing. Then some buildings loomed up out of the dark. He went up to the nearest one and banged on the door. He kept banging until he saw a light moving inside. A man opened the door and Willie collapsed into his arms. Ship, he gasped, on the beach, need help. The man sat the exhausted boy at his kitchen table and called for his wife, who came down and started fixing a cup of tea. Willie was soaked and covered in sand and seaweed. They toweled him down and wrapped him in a warm blanket. The rancher poured a large splash of rum into the boy's tea before handing it to him. The rancher explained that he was Peter Reinhold. His wife was Johanna. They ran a dairy ranch, now the historic Bee Ranch in the remote windswept lands just behind South Beach on Point Reyes. Willie said that there were probably other survivors still on the beach or on the wreck. Peter went out to wake up his ranch hands. Willie was cleaned up and given warm, dry clothes and a hearty breakfast. Peter came back in to say that they were leaving for the beach. Willie's ankle was so sore that he couldn't go with them. Peter and his men got their horses and rode down to the beach, arriving just as day broke. A hundred yards offshore were the twisted black remains of a large ship. Her masts were down, waves were breaking completely over her, and she seemed about to break up. There was no sign of anyone on the wreck or on the beach. They shouted and waved their lanterns, but got no reply. The men split up, heading each way to search for survivors or bodies. One party soon came upon a man lying face down on the sand. As they gathered around, reluctant at first to touch the body and whispering among themselves, the apparent corpse suddenly raised its head and looked at them as startled as they. He told them that his name was Hans Merkison, able seaman. He had left the ship with several other men and thought that they were pro had probably reached the shore as well. While the men continued their search for other survivors, Peter Reinhold offered the seaman his horse to ride back to the house. Like many sailors, the Norwegian was un unaccustomed to riding. He looked askance at the horse. Off, it's all the same to you, sir, he said. I'll walk. Accompanied by one of the men, he trudged off through the deep sand toward the house. No other survivors were ever found. A week after the wreck, a man named Owen Smith found a body tangled in the kelp along the tide line. He covered the body and walked 25 miles to Olima to call the county coroner, Edward Eden in San Rafael. Eden and a reporter drove his hearse to the Olima Hotel where they met the British consul, George Stanley, 
and the young apprentice, Willie Murray, who told them the whole story of the voyage and shipwreck. They then left to go see the body that had been recovered. The wind was brisk and cold on the, hit, on the beach. They gathered around and Coroner Eden pulled back the cover to reveal the body of a boy. His clothes were filled with sand, his hair tangled with seaweed, and his face sunburned. His eyes were open and bright, and he appeared to just be resting. Willie burst into tears at the sight and said that the boy was his friend and fellow apprentice, Frederick Potham. This is the listing for his burial in the potter's field at Alima. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be any uh, gravestone or any record of exactly where this was. More than 100 residents attended the boy's funeral. None of the other 19 bodies was ever recovered. When it was all over, the British consul Stanley asked Willie and Hans their plans for the future. Both said that they had had more than enough of the maritime life and intended to stay ashore. One of the Reinhold daughters had apparently taken a liking to young Willie. Oh, he's gonna stay with us for a few months, she asserted. Stanley offered to let the men's families know that they were safe. Willie explained that he was an orphan, but the, he and his brother and two sisters lived with their aunt and uncle in Glasgow. Well, this will be happy news to them, ventured the consul. No, sir, the boy answered, tears springing to his eyes. My cousin, their son, was lost with the ship. I have one more wreck to tell you, and this is a rather uh, tragic story as well. Uh, the story of the Hanalei in 1914, one of the most poignant and tragic wrecks that ever occurred on our coast. The Hanalei was a wooden hulled steam schooner, 175 feet long. In 1906, she was put on the run between San Francisco and Los Angeles. She was so popular with Los Angeles students attending the Northern universities that she, she became known as the university boat. Jack London sailed in her to gather material and inspiration for his books. In 1913, she began ferrying lumber and passengers between Eureka and San Francisco. On Sunday, November 22nd, 1914, the Hanalei left Eureka for San Francisco with a full load of shingles and railroad ties. She also carried 35 passengers, many headed home for Thanksgiving later that week. She had a crew of 31, commanded by Captain John Carey. A heavy fog came in during the night and visibility was reduced to near zero. About 10.30 Monday morning, Captain Carey got a good sight through the fog on, his ro on the rocky bluff of Point Reyes. He estimated that he was three miles off the point. He told his second mate, William C. Reese, that they would steer a course uh, to clear uh, Duxbury Reef, then head for the entrance to the Golden Gate. At 11.30, he retired to his cabin, leaving Reese in charge. At 11.45, he went below to have lunch. At 11.50, the lookout at the bow suddenly sang out, breakers ahead. First officer Thomas Scotty McTeague was washing up in his cabin when he heard the call. He rushed to the bridge, but before he got there, the homily was on the rocks. McTeague reached the bridge and found Reese staring dumbly at the cliff only 40 yards away. I, I thought I heard the Duxbury Reef whistling buoy and I hauled the ship in, said Reese. McTeague turned to the radioman, Lauren Lovejoy. Send out an SOS at once. Lovejoy went into the radio shack and began hammering out the Morse code. Captain Carey rushed onto the, breed, the bridge. It was my fault, Captain, said Reese. I turned too soon. Carey peered up at the 200 foot cliff looming over the bow. He could see at once that they were stuck fast, but he thought that since they were so close to shore, they would be rescued fairly easily. Frightened passengers were already pouring out onto the deck. Women were screaming and every time the ship slammed down on the rocks, there were more cries and shouts. Captain Carey went out on the wing bridge and called down to the throng of passengers milling around on the foredeck. Everyone, please keep calm. As you see, we have run aground, but we know where we are. That's the Marconi wireless station at Bolinas, right up there. There will be people coming to help. People began to gather on the top of the bluff. They could look right down onto the deck of the Hanalei, but there was no possibility of climbing down the cliff to help. 
between the blasts of the whistle, they shouted down to the ship that the lifesavers had been called from Point Bonita and Fort Point. Whoops. Yep. Um, the SOS was heard by several vessels, and by the end of the day, no fewer than 12 vessels were standing by just offshore. The problem was that the Hanalei had grounded so close to the shore that there were rocks all around her, preventing boats from approaching. At the same time, the pounding waves made it impossible to get to the wreck from shore. Several hundred people came out from Bolinas and gathered on the beach closest to the wreck, but there seemed to be no way to help. Two lifeboats drifted ashore, but both were swamped and empty. It was learned later that four men had made it back to the steamer and one was drowned. At half past two that afternoon, first mate Scotty McTeague set up the Lyle gun on the hurricane deck. He aimed it at the cliff top and pulled the lanyard. The barrel of the little cannon exploded and the projectile struck McTeague in the belly, sending him flying across the deck and breaking his ribs. The Hanalei settled deeper between the rocks and waves started to come aboard. The passengers and crew huddled on the raised hurricane deck aft. Later in the afternoon, a motor lifeboat arrived from the Point Bonita life-saving station. They tried several times to approach close enough to take off passengers, but each time the waves threw them back. Around four o'clock, there was a violent grinding crash and screams from the wreck. The Hanalei's keel had snapped in two. The stern swung around at right angles to the bow. Just before sunset, a second life-saving boat arrived from the Fort Point life-saving station. They too failed to reach the wreck. <clears throat> Captain Carey launched the last remaining lifeboat trailing a line to the Hanalei. It contained four of the crew and one passenger. For a moment it rode the waves, but then it capsized in the breaking surf and the line snapped. Three men clung to the boat and were saved when it washed ashore. The fourth man grabbed onto the line and was pulled back aboard the Hanalei. The fifth man was drowned. As the ship continued to break up, the people were pressed farther back onto the stern. Captain Carey sent the 10 women and three children, including a baby, to the top of the deck house, the highest point of the ship, where they clung to the rigging of the mast. Since they had lost power, radio operator Lovejoy climbed up there with them and used a flashlight to signal the shore. Someone from the Marconi station drove a car out to the edge of the cliff. By covering one of the headlights, he could reply to Lovejoy's messages. The people on the beach built bonfires to light the scene and provide some cheer to the desperate people on the wreck. The government vessels offshore turned their powerful searchlights on the wreck, casting the whole scene into glaring chiaroscuro. There was a brief break in the fog, and the people on the beach and atop the cliff could clearly make out the people on the wreck, one solid mass of squirming bodies clinging to whatever they could grasp as the waves swirled around them. But then the fog soon closed around them again. The San Francisco Examiner arranged to send a larger mortar gun and the crew of the Golden Gate Life Saving Station to the scene of the wreck. The crew and gun were shipped to Sausalito. A truck met the lifesavers at Sausalito and began the long drive to the site of the wreck. At 5.45, Elwood Schwerin, a UC student from Berkeley, volunteered to try to swim a line ashore. He tied a line around his waist and threw himself into the waves. He swam toward the roaring bonfires on the beach, but again and again he was pulled under and nearly drowned. With an almost superhuman effort, he managed to reach the shore and was pulled up onto the beach in a fainting condition. His first words were, did you get the line? But in his struggle in the waves, the line must have slipped off, for it was no longer attached to his waist. He collapsed and the lifesavers had to revive him. Three other passengers tried to swim ashore. Only one made it and was pulled from the water unconscious. The Point Bonita lifesavers landed on the beach and set up their own Lyle gun. Around 11 that evening, they fired a line toward the wreck. The first line fell short. They loaded their second charge, and this time the line bounced off the side of the vessel before anyone could grab it. They only had the two charges and could do nothing more. At midnight, the watchers on the shore heard singing. It was the people on the Hanalei singing hymns to keep up their courage. They sang throughout the night, periodically interrupted when the wreck cable lurch or a wave swept over them. At 2.30 a.m., a truck slid to a stop at the top of the bluff. It was the examiner's newspaper truck with the crew from the Golden Gate Life Saving Station and the big 150-pound Lyle gun. The news was flashed to Lovejoy and cheers could be heard from the ship. A battery-powered searchlight had been set up on the bluff, its beam illuminating the wreck. But the attempt was complicated by the fact that the wreck was rapidly breaking up. 
Only the aftermost section remained above water, black with struggling figures, but it was only a few yards square. Captain Nelson fired the line toward the ship, but it fell wide. The men had to reel the line back in for another try. Each time, Lovejoy flashed back how to correct the aim. Now, again and again, the line shot out, but never close enough for the people to reach it. At 4.40 in the morning, after more than 16 hours on the rocks, it was clear that the hull could not stand much more. Waves covered the deck, and the people on the cabin top were sometimes hidden in flying spray. Those watching helplessly from the shore could clearly hear the people on the ship singing, Nearer my God to thee. Suddenly, the lovely old hymn was broken off by a loud grinding groan of wood and a howl of despair. Lovejoy flashed the message, the Hanalei is breaking up. We are taking to the water. May God save us. The Coast Guard cutter McCulloch was close enough that they, quote, saw the wooden timbers of the doomed vessel bulge open, close, open again, and then burst like a watermelon struck with a sledge, unquote. Nearly 60 people were thrown into the sea. Illuminated by searchlights and watched by hundreds of horrified people, the struggling mass of bodies was swamped by waves and thrown against the jagged rocks. The ship's fuel tanks burst, covering the sea with a thick, viscous layer of oil that hindered swimmers and got into their gaping mouths and nostrils. One survivor, Mrs. Goldfinger, told of her experience. We all gathered in the stern, which was high in the air, although the spray broke over us and we were all soon drenched in cold. The noise of the breakers mingled with the cry of the little Franz baby. Mrs. Franz was awfully brave and tried to quiet the baby. When it grew dark, it was worse. It began to look then as though we wouldn't be rescued at all. We could see fires lighted on the beach and also the flash of the gun as the life crew tried time and again to shoot a line to us from the beach, but it always seemed to fall short. I think all of the women and even some of the men cried a little when the lines fell short. The shore looked so near and yet we were barred from it by the impassable barrier of rocks and angry waves, which even then were tearing the ship to pieces. I became so cold I was numb, probably mentally as well as physically. Fear of death seemed to leave me, and I watched the efforts of some of the men to swim ashore with lines. I cheered them. Later in the night, when it was pitch dark and the waves were breaking all over us, the cabin house on which I, with some 14 others, was clinging broke away. I was... It was lifted bodily off the ship, and the next minute we were all afloat on this frail piece of wreckage. I must have screamed with fright. There we were adrift on this wreckage, and we could dimly see the dark outline of the ship as it was pounded on the rocks, nearly covered with the flying spray, and to see men who still clung there. Then our piece of wreckage bumped on a rock, and a great wave broke clear over us, sweeping us all to one side, though we were all holding on for dear life. Mrs. Franz gave a scream. Mrs. Franz gave a scream and I saw that a wave tear the baby right from her arms. She must have fainted after that for she sank down and I thought she was dead. Then I saw the little babe floating away on the crest of a great wave and it vanished in the night. Oh, it made my heart sick even to think of it. We were helpless and expecting to go to our death any moment. Just then our wreckage hit a rock with terrible force and broke into what seemed to be a thousand pieces. We were all flung in all directions, and I seemed to go clear down to the bottom of the ocean before I finally came to the surface, nearly drowning and crying for help. There were cries all about me from men and women. Then a big piece of wood bumped into me, and I grasped it. I flung my arms around it and found it was a big railroad tie. I hung on for all I could, and it seemed as though the sea was trying to tear me away from it. They tell me I clung to the tie for two hours in that icy water, buffeted by the foaming waves. My only thought was to hang on. And after what seemed hours, I was rescued by the McCulloch. I can still hear the shrieks and screams of those who went down, and I am so numbed by the terrible experience that I can scarcely realize I have been saved. The horror of it will remain with me till I die. Another large portion of the wreck floated toward shore with 20 people clinging to it. When it was 100 yards offshore, someone managed to shoot a line aboard and people tailed on to haul them in but a spar projecting from the wreckage caught on a submerged rock and caused it to capsize. The water was dotted with struggling swimmers and floating bodies. The wreckage was washed up onto the beach and the lifesavers waded out and rescued six men still clinging to it, including Captain Carey and First Mate McTeague. Other lifesavers and citizens ventured out into the waves to try to reach people still struggling in the water. Boats from the government ships also nosed about as close to the rocks as they dared, picking up both survivors and bodies. 
Of the 35 passengers aboard the Hanalei, 20 were rescued and 15 died. Of the crew, 26 were rescued and five died, including second officer Reese, who had caused it all. Three lifesavers died as well. Before I conclude, I want to honor the men of the United States Life Saving Service, founded in 1848. The service established stations in the fog shrouded waters around San Francisco, Golden Gate Park in 1877, Fort Point in 1899, Point Reyes in 1890, Point Bonita in 1899, and Bolinas in 1915. That same year, the service was merged with the United States Revenue Service to create the Coast Guard. These men went out in the most appalling conditions, in many cases giving their lives to save others. My book is full of their brave deeds. Were it not for the vigilance and courage of these men, the, to the toll of the dead would be far higher than the 200 people known to have died on the coast of Marin. So these are the stories of six of the shipwrecks of Marin. The book has many more details on these, plus over 300 more. I'd be happy to answer your questions. <laughs> Thank you for that, Brian. That, those are really compelling stories. Um, tragic stories, many, but also the stories of the, the heroism, all the lives that were saved. Um, so thank you. Uh, if anybody has any questions, you can use the Q&A feature down below. And um, one question I had, I, it, you know, there have been hundreds of, of shipwrecks. I'm wondering, is there any idea of just how many perished? In, in these shipwrecks collectively? Yeah, I think around 200. Um, some of them are unclear. The numbers aren't known. Um, of course, there are also ships that um, set sail and never arrived. We don't know if they sank in Marin or not. Uh, the wrecks were never found. So it could be more than that. But um, I have documented 200 deaths. Do you have any information about uh which ships were carrying a lot of gold. <laughs> and I've, I know people don't, don't people go out and use metal detectors and oh, yeah. dive looking for buried sunken treasure. Yeah, uh, San Augustine is the big treasure that had a lot of gold aboard. Um, there are rumors that Drake left treasure here, but um, I see no evidence for it. I've read his, uh, um, the book that was written on his expedition, and um, they unloaded the sh his ship so they could careen it and clean the bottom, and they built a little fort on a sand spit to put it all in, and people said, oh yeah, it's probably all still there, but um, he just unloaded to um, lighten the ship, and after they had cleaned the bottom, they loaded it all back again, so um, the only thing that we know he left is the porcelain, which he, there was no point in taking Chinese porcelain to China, which is his next port of call. Um, he, he did leave as many as 30 people here. Um, and um, as one of them walked out, um, an Italian navigator named Nicolo Moreno. He walked to Monterey, Mexico. Took him years, but he finally walked out. And he said, El Draco left me in California. So uh, uh, there were some people left here. Um, there are a number of ships that had gold on them. Um, the Pacific, which uh, I started the story with, uh, didn't wreck in Marin, but it went down with tons of gold aboard. Um, so that might be a good uh, wreck to, to uh, dive on if you're a diver. Um, I don't know of any uh, large wealthy wrecks that, that sank here that were not recovered. There were a number of ships uh, where salvers later went out and recovered the gold. Uh, there was one that had uh, two large bars of bullion aboard that went down off Angel Island. Um, they were in a safe, and when they the, the ship didn't go down, it capsized. And when they recovered the ship, they found that the safe had broken loose and crashed right through the upper deck and and gone down. So they know about where it is, but um, it's out in the bay, so uh, it might be difficult to recover. We do have some more questions now. Yeah, Fran, you want to cover that? Yeah, those? I could take that for you, Brian. Uh, when was the last most recent shipwreck? Um, I haven't scanned the, the most recent newspapers. Uh, the last one in my book, I think, is in 19, 
75, there were um, two barges that went aground. One went off, um, they were uh, traveling together and they it came up, uh, broke from their towboat in a storm. One went up on Point Bonita and one went up um, uh, further up the coast, I think closer to, to um, Mirror Beach. Um, one of them was full of poisonous chlorine gas and the other one was full of beer. So you can imagine which one was uh, salvaged first. Um, the chlorine gas was a, a terrible hazard. They said that there was enough gas there to kill everyone in the Bay Area. Uh, the Coast Guard managed to um, go over it and pick it up with helicopters and get it all out safely. They decided not to tell everyone about this until after they had recovered the chlorine. Uh, the beer was all rescued quite promptly by local residents, I understand. Yeah, here's another that for people interested in the book. When was that published? And um... uh, I think, uh, let me see, uh, two years ago. It's two years ago. Okay. It's available on Amazon.com. If you just uh, go there and search for Shipwrecks of Marin, you should see it. You can also search for my name. And although there are several other people by Brian, named Brian Crawford, if you say Brian K. Crawford, uh, you'll find all my other books. I have uh, four other books on Marin history and uh, some books of fiction, a novel, uh, collections, uh, uh, reprints of old historical books that are out of print. Uh, so there's some stuff to browse there. Memoirs. Yeah, we have the Amazon link on our website as well. Oh, great. Um, the Copay, is that how you pronounce? C-O-P-E-E, -E. is that part of your research? Yes, oh, it's, it's a, a really interesting wreck, the Francois Coupe, um, oh. and it, it went around, um, uh, you know, Pierce Point at the northern tip of, of uh, the peninsula, Point Reyes Peninsula. Just on the west side of that point, there's a rock called Bird Rock, and they had the great misfortune to strike on that rock. Um, and the crew jumped from the ship onto the rock thinking that they were on shore. It, was, it struck at night um, and um, then found they were on this tiny rock all covered with bird guano and spent a really miserable time on the rock and were managed to uh, get ashore uh, the next day and had to walk in from there, uh, found a potato field and dug up potatoes and were, were discovered sitting out in the field eating raw potatoes. So it's quite a good story too. There, there really are some some poignant and fascinating stories amongst these wrecks. Uh, I only had time to tell you a few of them, but um, yes, if you buy the book, you'll uh, get to see all of them. I should add from one of these other comments, people want to support local booksellers like Copperfields. Do they generally have your book? Uh, they do. Okay. Uh, Copperfields has them, uh, White's Bookstore in San Anselmo, um, and uh, the Fairfax Variety carries them. And uh, for a long time, the Bolinas Museum had them. I'm not sure they still have any in stock. Um, and uh, they were at um, uh, uh, the one in Corte Madeira, Book Pass. Okay. Well, good to know. I think there's a two-parter, well, if we have time. Uh, one question was, have there been efforts to explore any of the wrecks? And maybe expounding on that, did you interview treasure hunters interested in researching that wanted to locate gold or other cargo. Yeah, there are uh, there are diving groups that, uh, you know, have dived on a lot of these wrecks. Um, there's a really fascinating one right off of uh, Point Bonita there, the, um, the uh, New York, yeah, I think it was. And um, it was carrying quite a lot of treasure. There were salvage um, attempts at the time, but it's considered so dangerous out there at Point Bonita that uh, they really, the Park Service really discourages diving there. But um, yeah, I've gotten letters from people um, saying that, yeah, I dove on that wreck or, you know, I recovered the anchor. Off, um, I just got one the other day. I recovered the anchor off the Francois Coupe. Um, so uh, yes, yeah, some of them are accessible. Of course, everyone would like to find the San Augustine um, the Park Service launched a, um, a sonar survey, ground penetrating radar and stuff, and they found a number of large objects buried in the sand right about the site, but I think they never had the funding to um, excavate it. Yeah, I see someone mentioning the... Okay. 
Yeah. One of the members of our audience says yeah. that uh, her, her father helped salvage the copay. Oh, really? So, a little bit of family history there with shipwrecks. Did it, have any ships ever crashed or uh, gone down at the Farallons? Have they yes. ever? No? It, many. Um, I did, include, did not include those in my book since they're not in Marin. I had to set a limit. There is a book on shipwrecks of the California coast that is not at all complete, but it has quite a few um, wonderful stories in it, and it has several about the Farallons. Uh, there were also a lot of wrecks on a, on a rock called Arch Rock, which was uh, south of Angel Island, out in the middle of the bay, quite a scenic rock with a hole through it, and just uh, dozens of ships ran into that, and they eventually dynamited it, blew it up that along with Blossom Rock and uh, um, Southampton Rock, a number of other rocks that were hazards to navigation and they uh, blew them up, uh, I think in the 20th century, and got rid of those. Um, and there were a lot on Angel Island, but the ones uh, that were not on the Marin side, I didn't include. By the way, I did a lot more research after I wrote this book on the Hanalei. I was so fascinated by that story and there was so much uh, newspaper coverage and articles written about it. Um, so I did a lot more research on that and put together um, quite a bit more information. I found a lot more pictures um, and I put together a YouTube video called The Wreck of the Hanalei that you can go look at. Um, that um, I found out a lot more about the Marconi radio station. It was one of the most powerful radio stations in the world. And the Hanalei did have a radio. It was one of the first ships on the West Coast to have a radio. So it's a little ironic that the first ship with a radio wrecked on the shore of the most powerful radio station in the world and, you know, couldn't be rescued. Um, but there's a lot of interesting history there. And the uh, radio station still stands. It's the uh, common wheel now. Uh, but you can go out and visit it and walk around. The old building's still there. You can actually get down on the beach and walk along the reef where the uh, wreck occurred. Uh, it's called RCA Beach now. So check out that YouTube video. Thank you, yeah. thank you, Brian. Th thank you. Let's have World War II. There must have been some, I think, perhaps. Yes, there were some. Uh, none come to my mind now. Um, th there was a terrible wreck down in um, Central California when a whole line of destroyers. Um, the first one would, made a mistake in its navigation and ran right up on the shore. And all the others had orders to follow that ship. And so all, all 10 of them ran aground. And uh, uh, quite a few lives were lost, I believe. I, I don't know the great de details of that, but it's considered rather a shameful experience in, in the Navy um, annals. Um, I have a couple of uh, Navy wrecks um, in my book. There, there were some, some uh, wrecks on uh, the east coast of Marin. Um, uh, there was a uh, one that was a, um, uh, a hay schooner that was coming down from, uh, well, as a schooner normally carried hay, it was coming down from Petaluma to San Francisco right after the earthquake, bringing a load of gravel to help repair the, the city and um, went aground and sank off of uh, St. Vincent's there on the east coast of Marin uh, with all hands. Um, what was striking about that was that all hands were women. It was a father and his uh, uh, teenage daughters were his crew. See, I, I don't think we have any more questions, but uh, Richard, do you want to talk a little bit about next week's or next month's program before we say goodbye to Brian? Well, you sure, I have one quick question for Brian. Did, did, I know it gets off the subject a little bit, but I remember reading about the airplane that crashed on the Bolinas Beach. Did you learn anything about that? Yes, again, I didn't include it, but uh, yeah, it, it uh, landed right on the beach there. Um, didn't go well, as you might expect. It's not good landing ground. Yeah. All right. Well, Brian, thank you very much. Very enjoyable program. Every time I hear you talk, I learn something else. So thank you for sharing. Uh, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. So uh, I'll, I'll talk briefly about our next program um, in April, April 2nd. It's a program that I prepared in uh, 2006 to commemorate the 1906 San Francisco earthquake and fire. My great grandfather had been the 
uh, army surgeon in charge of the hospital in the Presidio in San Francisco when he was given orders to be the chief sanitary officer for the entire city of San Francisco. Through, through his efforts and regulations, there ended up, <clears throat> there weren't any serious medical problems after the earthquake and fire, though there certainly could have been. And then while doing the research on that, we discovered an envelope with, uh, I think, 72 nitrate black and white negatives that my grandfather had taken starting pictures early in the morning of the earthquake. So it a, was a collection of photographs that hadn't been seen by anybody for about 100 years. So my great-grandfather, the surgeon, and my grandfather's photographs are the focus of the pro program on April 2nd. Hope to see you there. Thank you, Richard. And uh, that concludes our program. If, if you do have any follow-up questions, shoot us an email at the Moya Library, Ross Historical Society. Uh, you can find us on Facebook and you can just Google us and you'll find us on, uh, on the web. And we appreciate all of you joining us for this wonderful presentation by Richard Crawford today. Thank you and have a wonderful- Ryan Crawford. <laughs> Ryan Crawford. <Did> it... <laughs> all right. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everybody else, and hope to see you uh, next month. All right. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.